Hello, friends, and welcome to the City of the Immaculata. This is a place where we discuss history and theology, particularly the, through a Franciscan lens. Um, this is a new channel. Uh, I have a history of some old videos that I posted last March where my wife and I went through the um, consecration, uh, the Maximilian consecration. Um, I ask if you uh, would, please like and subscribe. And if you find this content helpful, maybe consider sharing it with others to help me out. Thank you. Today, we're going to be talking about the place of Franciscan theology within the church. Some questions to consider. Is there only one school of thought in Catholicism? Or are there multiple schools? Are Franciscans allowed to teach and preach their theology? What is the case made? What case is made that we, um, that's laity in general, um, may study, believe, and teach Franciscan theology? What of it are we allowed to believe? So in this, we're going to begin um, at the beginning uh, with two figures, St. Dominic and St. Francis. Uh, both um, come onto the scene concurrently uh, in a time of change, social change, political, and uh, religious change. Socially, um, there was changes within society. It was the rise of the merchant class at this time. Politically, uh, this was immediately following the times of the Gregorian reforms. So you have changes that are taking place um, between the temporal and spiritual powers and how they uh, relate to one another. This is a time of religious change. Uh, with the new social and political um, changes that have taken place, this is after the Great Schism. Um, this is after the period when the um, Italian peninsula specifically fell into a deep decline uh, in the 10th century and a renewal in the 11th century. But during that time of decline, there was a rise of heresy. And out of these heresies, there rose a need for preachers. So both Dominic and Francis saw a need for preaching. Preaching done through um, strict ascetical practices of prayer and devotion. To foster and nurture this devotion, they both founded their orders uh, um, as mendicant orders, that is, orders of um, begging, begging preachers. Both orders, the Dominican and Franciscan respectively, um, had unique charisms to the orders. The Dominicans were um, to preach the gospel and combat heresy. Uh, in particular, during Dominic's time, there was a heresy known as the Albigensian heresy, um, rose in the area of southern France, uh, that he was combating. And he places a strong emphasis on um, teaching and preparing friars for this task. Um, so because of this, within the Dominican order, there is an emphasis, um, and they gain a reputation for their learning. The Franciscan charism is one of um, poverty, chastity, and obedience, um, but also penance and a unique spirituality. And as we will see moving forward, um, there's a strong emphasis in the Franciscan order on learning. Principal successors of their uh, respective traditions are um, St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Bonaventure. Now, these men were contemporaries. They were both affiliated with the University of Paris, uh, both masters of their time in philosophy, metaphysics, theology. Um, they were uh, both summoned to the Council of Lyons, where they actually both died in the year, uh, I believe, 1274. In the coming decades uh, and centuries, 
um, as the orders become more at odds with one another, um, it's important that you keep in mind that both of these men knew each other, and that they loved one another, and they had a, both had a profound love for God. There's a story of St. Thomas himself visiting Bonaventure's cell um, while the latter was writing uh, his life of St. Francis. Um, St. Thomas finds Bonaventure in his cell in this state of ecstasy, and Thomas is said to have said, um, is reported to have said, let us leave a saint to the work of a saint. I'm of the opinion that oftentimes our differences are hyped up. Those of us that are... Um, more followers of Dominicans and those of us that are more followers of the Franciscans. Where we do disagree, um, even if we disagree fundamentally and irre irreconcilably, um, I don't think there's any need to an anathema one another. And where Holy Mother Church says that we have room to hold our variation opinions um, and where both are profitable, and when the uh, followers of either school disagree, I believe we must come back to the example of these two holy men and apply their charity that they apply to one another. We need to apply it to each other. Now, clearly, the Dominicans are the order of study and learning. This is not so clear with the Franciscans. Uh, there's a story in the um, Little Flowers uh, of the um, young man who comes to St. Francis and asks him if he could have the um, Psalter, if he could own his own Psalter. And uh, I, I point you to that story to read St. Francis's reaction to this man owning a Psalter. So the question is, you know, are Franciscans an order of learning? And um, fortunately for us, we have St. Francis's reply to St. Anthony of Padua. St. Anthony of Padua inquired from Brother Francis if he was allowed to teach. And um, this is the letter, um, this is the reply that we have from St. Francis. Quote, to Friar Anthony, my bishop, Francis sends greeting. It pleases me that you would teach sacred theology to the friars, so long as you do it in the study so long as in the study of this you do not extinguish the spirit of prayer and devotion, just as it says in the rule. So there we have it right there, right? Um, it's not a very long reply, but it packs a punch, okay? So within Franciscan theology, and you're going to see this all throughout, from Bonaventure to Scotus to the entire medieval tradition, right on up to the modern period, that the emphasis is to never exterior, extinguish the spirit of prayer and devotion in our study of sacred theology. So this is key. So moving forward, what I'm going to do is this first part, we're going to look at some of the learning that took place um, in the early periods of the Franciscan um, order how the how these men um, incorporated this unique Franciscan charism of learning and teaching and theology into the church, how the church absorbed it, incorporated it into the body of the church. And then um, we're going to shift gears later and go into some of the magisterial weight behind some of the Franciscan teachings, okay? So to start with, we're looking to look at um, probably the most important university of the Middle Ages, the University of Paris. Founded in the 12th century, the um, university uses the classic model of the um, trivium and quadrivium. Uh, eventually, the students, after going through that period um, of learning the, um, the three schools and the four schools, you would work your way to becoming a master of philosophy and then finally theology. So this is one of the most influential centers of learning. It's innovative in its, at the time, it's innovative in its uses of its sources and material. Um, in the early Middle Ages, when this university is coming into its own, you would join, young man would join about 13 years of age, stay for roughly six to 10, 12 years. Um, 
And this university, it's 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 sort of unique in that uh, for its time, and that it operated um, independent of secular rule. Uh, it was under the patronage of the papacy. So we're going to look at some people that sort of came through this university. And the first is Alexander of Hales, 1185 to 1245. Um, Alexander of Hales receives his master's in 1220. Uh, he is the first to introduce um, Peter Lombard's sentences as the, as the standard of study within um, theology. Now, it's it's difficult to emphasize how important this is, okay, for the rest of the Middle Ages. The implications are profound. Um, Peter Lombard's sentences, they're, um, basically, they're a compilation of sources of um scriptural and patristic sources that uh, all throughout the Middle Ages, uh, to get your master's in theology, you would have to write commentary on these sentences. So basically, you're writing commentary on the commentaries. Um, so Alexander of Hale's introduction of Peter Lombard's sentences um, has a profound effect on later um, Catholics. He enters the Franciscan order at uh, 50 years of age. As you can see um, with this timeline here, he's very early within the order, the life of the order. So at 50 years of age, he comes into the order. Uh, he defends the study of Aristotle in Rome in an audience with the Pope. And this is kind of interesting because uh, this is an era as well when Aristotle has first come back into the Western usage. And he's being taught openly at the schools. So um, when Aristotle comes back and just makes his return, his, his corpus, his body of work makes his return from the East. Um, and he's been influenced by certain Eastern Muslim thinkers, principally um, Avicenna. What you have is a strong, um, dare I say, traditionalist backlash against the teaching of Aristotle. Later, after this, um, after this, what would have been this period, um, Alexander of Hales' time, um, there was actually a condemnation of Aristotle, uh, and even a condemnation of certain propositions that include certain propositions um, of Thomas Aquinas. Alexander of Hales is in this long line of thinkers of the time who come to the defense of Aristotle and say, no, we're reading it through the lens of Avicenna. We have to stop, take a step back, and give this its fair shake. Okay, So he defends Aristotle in Rome in an audience with the Pope, which I just think is an interesting fact. Um, he's the first Franciscan to hold a university chair. Uh, he attends the First Council of Lyons, 1245. This is a, a reunion council with the um, Eastern Church, so that's kind of interesting. Um, his Summa Fratris Alexandri has a, a profound effect on uh, later scholastic method and content. So again, he's one of these early minds that's grappling with Aristotle, you know, how Aristotle fits into the um, language of Christian um, theology, how he doesn't fit, um, and how where it does fit in, how it's profitable for, um, how it's profitable and benefits the Christian language. After that, we have uh, John de la Rochelle, 1200 to 1245. He's trained under Alexander of Hales, um, later trained St. Bonaventure. Uh, he helps to complete Alexander's Summa Fratris Alexandri. Um, this this is kind of an interesting thing. This is common at the time where the students of the teacher were often, um, you know, obviously if it's your teacher, if it's your master, you probably admire him. Um, and you would complete or even com just compile um, the works of someone, of your teacher after they were gone. Um, I mean, oftentimes the students themselves were the scribes of the teacher. So you know, when you have like someone like St. Thomas Aquinas, he would have um, scribes writing down what he's teaching them, what he's preaching to them. So even Thomas 
who stopped writing early, um, prematurely, we'll say, uh, he finished his um, summa somewhere in the third part, I believe. And so the finished third part is actually from his students. And you can see that here, you know, with um, Jean de La Rochelle, you know, he completes the work of Alexander's uh, Pales is um, summa. Uh, he's the first Franciscan to hold a bachelor's from the University of Paris. Um, through his various summas, he helps to incorporate Aristotle into the corpus of medieval discussions. So again, we're continuing this tradition, right, of bringing Aristotle into the fold. Still not done yet, right, because we still have condemnations coming, but this is a time when they are really working hard to get Aristotle um, an orthodox teaching. So it's an interesting time. Um, I often don't think that it's appreciated or emphasized enough just how original these thinkers were. I won't say revolutionary, that's kind of a loaded word, especially when we're dealing with orthodoxy, but just how they engaged their sources. They're every bit, if not more rig rigorous um, than even the patristic were. You know, and that's just my that's my personal take on it. Yes, I will do some editorializing as we go through this. You have to forgive me of that. You can disagree if you want, but um, I do think that their rigor in the scholastic age was um, every bit as rigorous as any period that you will find before since. All right, so St. Bonaventure. We've discussed him a little bit already, but we'll just, um, and we're going to discuss him some more. Uh, but for right now, just um, realize. Um, he studies at the university uh, before his entrance into the order in 1243. He's arguably the most educated man of this age. And that's saying a lot. I mean, this is the age of Aquinas. This is the age of Albert the Great. Bonaventure was an extremely educated man. So I'm not saying that lightly. He was likely fluent in Greek. We're not for sure. He uh, was certainly familiar with and helped to incorporate many of the Eastern fathers into the... Um, into the Western context. And I want to say, while Aquinas also engaged the Easterners much more than I think we appreciate, I'm of the opinion that Bonaventure more consistently incorporated it into the Western context. Consistent, what I mean by that is not as many contradictions, consistent with the Eastern narrative. I would point you to the work of uh, Father Christian Capes on that. Um, if you go to academia, he's got a work on how um, Genadius Galarius um, was influenced later later on um, by the Franciscan school, principally Bonaventure. Uh, so let's see. Uh, by 1253, he holds the Franciscan chair at Paris University. Uh, 1257, he becomes the minister general. Now, he's minister general at a time when the cohesion of the um, Franciscan order was beginning to break down a little bit. You have um, a group that's forming called the Spirituals. Uh, you have another group that's the more lax group of the order. Um, and they're starting to splinter, as will become um, the the... <laughs> Uh, narrative of the order moving forward. But at this time, Bonaventure uniquely is able to hold it all together. Everybody respects and loves Bonaventure, all sides. Um, later on, as I mentioned before, he's the principal mediator of the East and West Dialogues at the Council of Lyon in 1247, where he dies. If you think about that year, 1247, that council, we lose St. Thomas Aquinas on the way to that council. We lose Bonaventure at that council. 1247, the year of our Lord. We lost two wonderful thinkers in the church. Um, it's just kind of mind blowing to me. And that, you know, that's very rarely ever brought up uh, that in that year, our Lord called him two of the greatest minds I think that the church has ever produced. Some of his works that he's known for is his commentary on the sentences of Peter Lombard, his Breviloquium. The, itinerar the itinerarium, that is the mind's journey into God, um, de reductios, de reduction, 
These are some of the most important works in the scholastic era and of all of Christianity. The University of Oxford. So now we're moving north a little bit. Uh, Oxford is not so much founded as it evolves. <laughs> um, we think what happens is as the students are coming out of Paris, um, coming back from the continent, they begin taking this campus and turning it into their own collegiate university from which Oxford comes. Um, but this university is going to have a lasting effect on Franciscan history and all of Christianity for that matter. So for the sake of time, uh, we're just going to go through a few names here of note that are part of this English Franciscan tradition. I'm actually going to be doing a uh, video later on English, a uh, series of videos on English Christian history. Um, and I'll probably be going through most of these men more in depth than that. But just for now, um, let's see, we have William of Ware. 1290-1305, um, studies at Oxford, teaches at Paris, um, teacher of blessed John Duns Scotus, a um, early scholastic proponent of the Immaculate Conception. Uh, we have Brother Roger Bacon, 1220. These are these are all um, Franciscans too, by the way. These are all brothers. Um, studies and teaches at Oxford. Um, he is known for promoting Aristotle as a um, method. What I mean by that is instead of um, the common way of teaching Aristotle, which is teaching what Aristotle taught, the content, Bacon emphasized teaching the method that Aristotle used and applying it to your own um, deduction, seeking scientific truth. Um, so he's he's said to be something of a leader of a sort of proto empiricism, proto empiricism, the later um, empirical scientific method, if you will. Then we have Blessed John Duns Scotus. Um, we'll be speaking about him a little bit more later, uh, but for now, 1265, 1308, uh, teaches at Oxford, teaches at Paris and Cologne. Um, he's a master synthesis and um, his master synthesis and precision in language and metaphysics and theology is um, almost unparalleled. Um, he's known for, um, among other ideas, his teachings on uh, univocity, hoxiety, formal distinction, primacy of the will and charity, the immaculate conception, and the absolute primacy of Christ. Um, so he's hugely influential on all later Franciscan schools and Catholicism in general. Then we have William of Ockham, 1287 to 1347. Studies at Oxford, never receives his master's. I'm going to be honest, I'm not a big fan of Ockham. I'm not totally familiar with all of his work, but what I know I haven't been impressed with. He was controversial in his own day. He's controversial today. By far not universally received in the church, but he's undoubtedly been influential. Um, he's known for nominalism, for strict voluntarism, uh, for his teachings on the universals, and for um, probably most of what he's most well known for, at least colloquially, is his Occam's Razor. All right, so the Franciscan Studium. Now, throughout the late medieval, medieval period, um, the Franciscan schools, studiums, if you will, are opening up all over Europe. Uh, within the 32 provinces of the Franciscans, um, there are often more than one studium within a single province. Um, some schools are um, don't fall under this title, but they still taught students. Is. So some some aren't necessarily a studium, but they're still teaching. Um, interesting little fact here is that after. Um, Blessed John Duns Scotus comes onto the scene. Bonaventure wasn't as predominant in the schools anymore. Um, his language was often seen as less precise in the light of the eras of other thinkers that came between Bonaventure and Scotus, particularly Henry of Ghent. Scotus becomes the more preferred. Oftentimes he's accused of sort of um, being the... Um, 
uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Being the, I don't, he doesn't dissent from Bonaventure. That's not what he's accused of, but basically overtaking Bonaventure in the Franciscan schools. Um, and even his schools, though, were diverse. Some of his schools um, prefer being more proper, rigorous Scotists. Um, some are the Marianists after Francis of Marone, um, and other are Bonatists after Nicholas Bonatus. Um, so there's a lot of diversity within these schools. The studiums culminate in the Pontifical University of St. Bonaventure, founded in 1587. Now, this is an important thing, and I want to emphasize this here. Um, known as the Seraphicum. Now, when you have the papacy not only verbally endorsing, but founding a university in Rome to cultivate the study of Franciscan theology, this is a strong endorsement, okay? So if we look at what's going on here, starting from the University of Paris, the same time that Aquinas is teaching, at the same time that Albert is teaching, the Franciscans are there. Alexander of Hales, Don de la Rochelle, Bonaventure, moving up to Oxford, William of Ware, Blessed John Duns Scotus, opening of all these schools, culminating in 1587 in the Seraphicum. This is a strong endorsement. There's just no way around it, a Franciscan teaching. By the eve of the French Revolution, um, we have a Franciscan theologian who says that the Scotus schools outnumbered all other schools, all other schools combined. We're talking about thousands of degrees given to hundreds, hundreds thousands of degrees over hundreds of years that are fully backed by the magisterium of the church. So all of this is to say that this is not a fringe sect than the Catholic Church. The Franciscan school, um, part of the purpose of this video is that my channel is going to be dealing with Franciscan theology. And I want to, as the best that I can, to the best of my ability, show through the backing of the church that Franciscan theology is not fringe, it's got a long pedigree, and that it's backed by the church. And this is good evidence right here of its backing, the Seraphicum. Okay, so now we're going to shift gears a little bit. Let me get a drink of water. So I want to start talking more about magisterial weight behind specific teachings. So in certain circles, within and without the Catholic Church, there's an emphasis on Thomas that, that places St. Thomas not only in a position of prominence, not even only in a position of primacy, but in a position of exclusion to all others. They will say that Thomas is not only um, master in method, but he's master in content. And that to be a Catholic is to be a Thomas. And it's not only in content, but it's in a very specific reading of that content. So we're going to run through the context um, through which St. Thomas gained this prominence and primacy. We're going to parcel out, and I'll leave it for you to decide. I'm of my opinion. You'll see it by the end here, obviously, which side I fall on, of whether or not Thomas has a place of primacy or exclusion, exclusivism, if you will. Um, so to give Thomas and to give the other side its due, we're going to look at um, two encyclicals specifically. Now, I'm going to quote at length. So who knows how much of my viewership uh, will remain at this point. There's going to be a lot of citations. Um, but I feel like it's important to have the full context um, context to make sure that um, to make sense of all the source material so that when people are making strong claims, about the exclusivism of Thomas. Um, I want to go to the sources of where they're saying this is from, okay? So we're going to look at Eterni Patris, encyclical from Pope Leo XIII in 1879, 
and Doctoris Angelici from Pope Pius X. Um, I don't have the date there, but I believe it would have been around 1910, roughly. So, Attorney Patris. And I'm just going to read it. Among the scholastic doctors, the chief and master of all, Howard's Thomas Aquinas, who, as Cajetan observed, because he has, quote, most venerated the ancient doctors of the church in a certain way seems to have inherited the intellect of all. The doctrines of those illustrious men, like the scattered members of a body, Thomas collected together and cemented, distributed an order, wonderful order, and so increased with important additions that he is rightly and deservedly esteemed the special bulwark and glory of the Catholic Church. With his spirit at once humble and swift, his memory ready and tenacious, his life spotless throughout, a lover of truth for its own sake, richly endowed with human and divine science. Like the sun, he heated the world with the warmth of his virtues and filled it with the splendor of his teaching. Philosophy has no part which he did not touch finely at once and thoroughly. On the laws of reasoning on God and incorporeal substance, on man and other sensible things, on human actions and the principles, he reasoned in such a manner that in him there was wanting neither a full array of questions nor an apt disposal of the various parts, nor the best method of proceeding, nor soundness of principles or strength of argument, nor clearness and elegance of style, nor a facility for explaining what is a truce. Moving on. Moreover, the angelic doctor pushed his philosophical inquiry into reasons and principles of things, which because they are most comprehensive and contain in their bosom, so to say, the seeds of almost infinite truths, we were to be unfolded in good time by later masters with, glad, with a goodly yield. And as he used this philosophic method and reputation of error, he won the title of distinction for himself that single-handedly, single-handed, he victoriously combated the errors of former times and supplied invincible arms to put those to rout, which might in after times spring up, again clearly distinguishing as is fitting reason from faith, while happily associating the one with the other, he both preserved the rights and had regard for the dignity of each. So much so, indeed, that reason, born on the wings of Thomas to its human height, can scarcely rise higher while faith could scarcely expect more or stronger aids from reason than those which he has already obtained through Thomas. That's a lofty endorsement. I mean, there's no doubt about it, right? This is Attorney Patris. This is a papal encyclical, so I'm not an expert on magisterial um, weight, but encyclicals I know are higher up on the ladder. There may be some other documents that you might get from the papacy. Dr. Angelic. This is from Pope Pius X. He says, We used in the text of that letter, recommended, I, I'm, he's talking about Attorney Patris, we used in the text of that letter, recommending the philosophy of Aquinas was particularly, and not exclusively, Certain persons persuaded themselves that they were acting in conformity to our will, or at any rate, not actively opposing it, and adopting indiscriminately and adhering to the philosophical opinions of any other doctor of the school, even though such opinions were contrary to the principles of St. Thomas. They were greatly deceived, and recommending St. Thomas to our subjects as supreme guide in scholastic philosophy, it goes without saying that our intention was to be understood as referring above all to those principles upon which that philosophy is based at its foundation. For just as the opinion of certain ancients is to be rejected, which maintains that it makes no difference to the truth of the faith what any man thinks about the nature of creation, provided his opinions on the nature of God be sound, because error with regard to the nature of creation begets a false knowledge of God. And so the principles of philosophy laid down by St. Thomas Aquinas are to be religiously and invaluably observed because they are the means of acquiring such a knowledge of creation as is almost 
as is most congruent with the faith, of refuting all the errors of all the ages, and of enabling man to distinguish clearly what things are to be attributed to God and to God alone. And we continue. We therefore desired that all teachers of philosophy and sacred theology should be warned that if they deviated so much as a step in metaphysics, especially from Aquinas, they exposed themselves to grave risk. We now go further and solemnly declare, declare that those who in their interpretations misrepresent or affect to despise the principles and major theses of this philosophy are not only not following St. Thomas, but are ever far astray from the saintly doctor. If the doctrine of any writer or saint has ever been approved by us or our predecessors with such singular condemnation and in such a way that to the condemnation were added an invitation in order to propagate and defend it, it may easily be understood that it was so commended to the extent that it agreed with the principles of Aquinas or was in no way opposed to them. I mean, this is strong language here, guys, okay? So when people are giving um, Thomas you know, a place of primacy or some of them read it exclusion, um, this, this is where some of this language is coming from for them. Therefore, that the philosophy of St. Thomas may flourish and corrupt and entire in schools, which is very dear to our heart, and that the system of teaching which is based upon the authority and judgment of the individual teacher and therefore has a changeable foundation whence many diverse and mutually conflicting opinions arise, not without great injury to Christian learning, be abolished forever. It is our will, and we hereby order and command that teachers of sacred theology and universities, academies, colleges, seminaries, and institutions enjoying by apostolic indult the privilege of granting academic degrees and doctorates in philosophy, use the Summa Theologica of St. Thomas as the text of their predilections, comment upon it in the Latin tongue, and let them take particular care to inspire their pupils with the devotion for it. Doctoris Angelici. Okay. So let's give a little context here. By the time by the time of Pope Leo the Thirteenth, by the time that he put pen to paper for Attorney Patres, Europe was already awash with blood. We have the French Revolution, where the church was just absolutely decimated. All the universities had been nationalized. Uh, monasteries had been dissolved. It was just a crushing blow for France. Following in the wake of that, we have the revolutions of the 19th century. Um, you have the revolutions of 1848. France, Germany, Italy, the Austrian Empire, all of these swept up in class revolution. Uh, you have the Franco-Prussian War, where we lose the Papal States. You have the Italian national revolutions, which were all very anti-clerical, okay? And in the midst of all of this, in the midst of all of this, in the 19th century, there's the rise of a new um, philosophical landscape. So what are the popes doing here, right? Pope Leo the Thirteenth. This is after this is after the First Vatican Council. He's looking at the political, philosophical, and spiritual landscape of the nineteenth. Uh, with Pope Pius the Tenth, he's looking at the early twentieth century, and in particular, the nineteenth century was just absolutely disastrous for the faith. What Attorney Patris is saying is that St. Thomas Aquinas, and this is, you know, I, the, the best, um, not, not the best, but rather the most polemical of Franciscans or Jesuits or the other orders would admit 
that when you read St. Thomas Aquinas, you're, you're reading somebody who has a wonderful clarity to his writing. So what they're saying is that St. Thomas, by his organization, by his clarity of style, he's providing a ready-made philosophical counter to modernity, right? The church had been decimated. This is after the French Revolution. The universities have been taken over. This flourishing of Catholic learning that had been going on all throughout the Middle Ages, well, that's over with. By the time of Pope Leo XIII, almost 100 years are over with. And he's saying, we need to recover it. And here we have somebody that's ready. Okay? St. Thomas, you know, he's ready to take it on. He can combat the modern philosophies with all of its errors. You know, we could use Thomas to take on Descartes and Kant and Hegel. Pope Pius X himself, you know, and he's looking, if you if you kind of notice here what he's doing, he's backing up Attorney Patris, and he's wanting to put it into practice within the seminary specifically. I mean, look, he says the universities, academies, colleges, seminaries, and institutions, right? So he's saying, look, this is where Attorney Patris is out. We're backing it up. We want to implement it. But keep in mind, with Pope Pius X in particular, he was a Franciscan. Okay, a lot of people don't know this about Pope Pius X, Pope Saint Pius X. Um, he was a secular Franciscan. So, after he, um, after Pope Leo the Thirteenth um, put this document out, there was some questioning, and the. Um, the, the Minister General of the um, OFMs sent a letter to Pope Leo XIII inquiring of him, were we still allowed to teach what we have been teaching for centuries? Pope Leo XIII affirmed it. And over the next 50 years, there were several other inquiries all backed up the same. Backed up the same as in Franciscans, you should ten, continue to teach what you teach. Okay, so what are the consequences of attorney patris? Well, by the early 20th century, there is a revival of Thomism uh, that we commonly refer to as neo-scholasticism, the neo-scholastic period. I think it's a little bit of a uh, misnomer because what it implies is that Thomas was the fullness of the um, scholastic period. And as we're going to show here in a little bit, it's really not true. So I think a better term for it would probably be Neo-Thomism. And uh, this is an era of what we call the uh, manualist tradition in the style of, uh, of Ludwig, Ludwig Ott and his um, fundamentals on the um, Catholic very um it's accused of being very dry you know i'm, I'm a little um, wary of referring to it as dry because um, sometimes there's there's depth to these works that um, the the people that are left studying them don't quite um, get the depth out of them that's in the work because they if, if you spent any time with the manuals, you could learn why um, they're challenging for students in particular. Um, by 1917, um, we have the 24th Thesis of Thomism. This is a series of, um, so following Pope Pius X's um, encyclical, uh, they wanted to know, they were very concerned with what teachings of Thomas, how, rather, how Thomas was being taught in the seminary. So they presented, I would say they reduced Thomas down to the quote-unquote fundamentals, right? 24 fundamentals of Thomas. Um, I'm not a big fan of this. I see what they were trying to do. They were making sure that when Thomas was taught, he was taught in an orthodox, quote-unquote, manner. Um, but I think that really just kind of 
defeats the spirit of Thomas's work, right? Um, when I engage Thomas or when I engage the scholastics in general, it doesn't seem like they're just putting pen to paper and writing down um, dogma, right? They're, they themselves are engaging multiple sources. Right? Thomas engaged a lot of sources. So to reduce his work down to these 24 um, articles, uh, I don't know. Anyways, um, this is the consequence of this. Um, 1917 Code of Canon Law recommends that St. Thomas specifically, I believe, through these 24 theses um, be used in seminary formation. Now, the backlash to all of this is um, it's, it's fairly large. Okay, Now, you do have some entrenched, um, strong advocates of this neo-scholastic tradition coming into the mid-20th century. Garigou Lagrange was um, one of the principal defenders of it. Um, but by the mid to later 20th century, most of the formidable um, theologians in opposition to it, um, the backlash becomes quite, quite evident. And, you know, there's there's many names that you could name with this. Um, Ratzinger among them, Balthazar, de Lubach, these people. And it was never, if you read them, my reading of them, and I'm by no means an expert in their work, but my reading of them, um, Balthazar, Ratzinger, these men all appreciated Thomas. They all love Thomas. You know, he's a he's a phenomenal um, thinker. What they didn't like was how Thomas was presented to them. That's my reading of it. Okay, so that's what the backlash was. It was never a backlash against Thomas per se, just how Thomas was presented. Okay, so now what is the problem that what is the problem that um, SCOTUS has? Quote unquote problem. Well, SCOTUS dies young. His surviving work um, is principally very complex, lengthy commentaries and notes. Okay. Um, most of his thought is parceled out later by his followers, and it primarily redained, uh, remained in academic circles. When you read Thomas's Summa, um, with just a little bit of guidance, you know, you can hit the ground running, Thomas. With Scotus, it's these very long tracks where he's going from this syllogism to this syllogism to this to this to this and sometimes you don't know whether he's even arguing for or against a position right um, so it's very very complex so it's left to his later followers to sort of work out um, what scotus taught and um, it's kind of a mess to be honest with you the schools were were, were were strong, they were vibrant, but in terms of a cohesive, ready-made thing, it wasn't there, right? And so even into the 20th century, we didn't have critical edition of his work. Um, there was some pseudo-SCOTUS work going around that was of a uh, questionable nature. Um, and from my understanding, um, Pope Pius X was... Um, wanted to beatify SCOTUS, but was hit. Um, I've heard from a group of Dominicans um, with these questionable texts, so he had to back off. Um, but now we have these critical editions, and there's never been a proposition of SCOTUS's that has been condemned. But regardless, you know, compare this with Thomas. As we said, you know, Thomas um, wrote comprehensively, he wrote clearly, he wrote forcefully. It's all kind of ready-made, okay? Now, what's the problem? Quote, I'm putting in quotes here, right? What's the, quote, problem with Bonaventure then? Well, within the Franciscan school, as I uh, mentioned already, um, after the time of Blessed Scotus, he takes the place of primacy um, as his language is seen as more precise. Um, in the wake of some errors that took place after St. Bonaventure. So because of this primacy, there is no really 
ready-made schools of Bonaventure that are capable of battling modernity in the way that the neo-termists were prepared to. And he's unfairly um, at times accused of um, a sort of fideism, right? But if you read Bonaventure in context, um, it's not the case at all with him. So um, for both St. Bonaventure and for Blessed Scotus, um, in my personal opinion, right, this, this is editorializing again for me. I'm going to do this every once in a while, I'll editorialize that my own opinion. Um, but I think within the last 100 years, all of this has kind of changed, okay? Uh, we're, we're at sort of a moment in time where we're sort of ready to um, work and engage Bonaventure and Blessed Scotus in ways that maybe 100 years ago when um, Pope Leo was writing, Pope Leo XIII was writing, and when um, Pope um, Pius X was writing, that we weren't quite ready. And there's still a lot of work to do, don't get me wrong, but um, with, with Bonaventure and the SCOTUS and with the Franciscan School in general, I think we're sort of, um, we're, we're, we're at a pivot point, right, where we can start applying them. And I think um, in ways where filling in, I'm, I'll put it this way, he's ready in ways to fill in gaps where um, there's maybe some holes left with the Thomistic system of things. I'll just say it like that. Okay, so we looked at those um, other works, um, Attorney Patres um, and Pope Pius the Tense Encyclical, um, The Angelic Doctor. Now I want to um, give the other side, the Franciscan side, its due. So we're going to look at some different um, papal documents here of varying degrees of magisterial weight. Again, I'm not an expert in magisterial weight laying out magisterial teachings, but at the very least, all of these are ordinary teaching, I believe, of the papal office. So the first we're going to look at is Triumphatis Hierusalem, Pope VI, the sixth, uh, 1588. Um, this is a papal bull. We're going to relook again at some paragraphs in Attorney Patris. Uh, we are going to look at um, Studiodorum Ducem from Pope Pius XI, 1923. It's an encyclical. Uh, we're going to look at Alma Perens, Pope Paul VI, 1966. That's an apostolic letter. Uh, Fides et Ratio by Pope John Paul II from 1998, an encyclical. And then we are going to look, uh, we're going to finish up with Bonaventure and Thomas um, from Pope Benedict XVI, 2010. This is, that would have been one of his general audiences. All right, so first, um, Triumphantis Hierusalem. Um, this is from Pope Sixtus the Sixth. Um, he was a Franciscan. I believe this was when he um, founded, he's the one that founded the Seraphicum. So I believe that this bull was in conjunction with the founding of the Seraphicum. So let's see what he has to say. And this is, uh, he's speaking here of St. Bonaventure specifically. Um, it's the Pontifical Academy of Bonaventure. So Quote, for he, that is Bonaventure, left those monuments of his divine genius to those who would come after him, by which questions very difficult and involuted, with many obscurities, are explained methodically and in order, straightforwardly and loosely, with the great bounty of the best arguments, the truth of the Catholic faith is illustrated, pernicious errors and profane heresies are overthrown, the pious minds of the faithful are admirably inflamed with the love of God and the desire of the celestial fatherland. So this is some strong language, okay? Listen to this language here. The truth of the Catholic faith is illustrated. Pious minds of the faithful, that's us, are admirably inflamed with the love of God and the desire for the celestial fatherland, for the desire from heaven. This is based, this is saying, this is what happens when we study Bonaventure. Let's continue. Finally, the utility of the universal church moves us, which can always be more and more richly captivated by the erudition of such a doctor. 
especially when the ambushes and the diabolical machinations of heretics, by which they oppose most vehemently in this sad age that sacred theology, which is called scholastic, admonish us greatly that we should retain, explain, and propagate this same theology as something which nothing can be more fruitful for the church of God. For with the divine gift of him who alone gives the spirit of knowledge and wisdom and understanding, and who furnishes his church throughout the lifetimes of generations as is needed, with new benefits, and who provides her with new supports, there have been there has been discovered by our ancestors, most wise men, scholastic theology, which by two doctors, glorious above all, the angelic St. Thomas and the seraphic St. Bonaventure, the most brilliant professors in this capacity, and first among those who have been registered among the number of saints, with excellent genius, assiduous study, great labors, and vigils have refined and decorated it, and have passed it on to those who would come alter optimally arranged, and in many ways very clearly explained. And indeed, such a salutary understanding and practice of this science, which spread abroad from the richest sources of divine letters, Roman pontiffs, holy fathers, and councils, could certainly always bring the greatest assistance to the church, either to understand and interpret, truly and sensibly, the scriptures themselves, or to read through and explain the fathers more securely and usefully, or to detect and refute the various errors and heresies. So he's saying here, right? The Roman pontiffs, the holy fathers and councils, could certainly always bring the greatest assistance to the church, either to understand and interpret truly scripture, and the church fathers by the use of what he calls the two doctors glorious above all. Okay. And this is going to be a common theme here about these two doctors. All right. So a few more. Wherefore, so that the erudition of the seraphic doctor may be more diffused, more broadly to the utility of the many. And so that from his books and works, erudite and studious men may daily seize more copious and more tasty fruit, which must not be doubted, will add to the glory of this very saint, though he is most blessed in heaven. We establish that indeed, at the first in our kind city, and this basilica of the twelve holy apostles, a college by the name of St. Bonaventure, in which sacred theology, especially from the works and commentary of this exceptional, exceptional, and devout doctor is publicly explained. And on the account of that, we, hoping in the Lord, that the nightly study of the seraphic doctor in doctrine and devotion, which we greatly desire to shine and burn among the clergy and Christian people, will be the greatest help. And we determine and will that his books, commentaries, smaller works, and in short work, and in short all his works, be cited, published, and when demanded, employed in a manner in which they have been most faultlessly published by our Vatican press, as has been said above, just as are there those of the other doctors of the church who are exceptional, not only in private, but publicly. Listen to this. In lecture halls, academies, schools, colleges, and lectures, disputations, interpretations, dresses, sermons, and in all other ecclesiastical studies and Christian practices. Okay. This is much of the same that we heard from Attorney Padres about where we should be teaching Thomas. Well, here we're getting an endorsement, too, about teaching Bonaventure. Okay, speaking of Attorney Padres, let's go back to Attorney Padres. So that was Pope Sixtus VI Six and his endorsement of studying and teaching and preaching on Bonaventure. Now, I want to give a little bit of context as well about what Attorney Padres says about what the intent is here. And keep in mind, too, again, what the backdrop of that letter was, right? We talked about the revolutions, the, the social political revolutions that had taken place from the French Revolution to the time that Pope Leo wrote this. So from Attorney Patrice. 
Later on, the doctors of the Middle Ages, who were called scholastics, addressed themselves to a great work, that of diligently collecting and sifting and storing up, as it were, in one place, for the use and convenience of posterity, the rich and fertile harvest of Christian learning scattered abroad in volume, it's a hard word for me, voluminous works of the Holy Fathers. And with regard, venerable brethren, to the origin, drift, and excellence of the scholastic learning, it may well be it may be well here to speak more fully in the words of one of our wisest of predecessors, Pope Sixtus V, quote, By divine favor of him who alone gives the spirit of science, wisdom, and understanding, and who thou ages as there may be need, enriches this church with the blessings, new blessings, and strengths, strengthens it with safeguard. There was founded by our fathers, most men of eminent wisdoms, the scholastic theology, which two glorious doctors, in particular, Angelic St. Thomas and the Seraphic St. Bonaventure, illustrious teachers of this faculty, with surpassing genius and by unwary diligence, and at the cost of long labors and vigils, set in order and beautified, and when skillfully arranged and clearly explained in a variety of ways, handed down to posterity. And indeed, the knowledge and use of so salutary a science, which flows from the fertilizing fonts of sacred writings, the sovereign pontiffs, the holy fathers, and the councils, must always be of the greatest assistance to the church, whether with the view of really and soundly understanding and interpreting the scriptures more safely and to better purpose reading and explaining the fathers. Right, so this is what we were reading, similar to what we were reading before. Finally, Although these words seem to bear reference to solely, solely to scholastic theology, nevertheless, they may plainly be accepted as equally true of philosophy and praises. For the noble endowments which make scholastic theology so formidable to the enemies of truth, truth to wit, as the same pontiff adds, that ready and close coherence of cause and effect, that order and array of a disciplined army in battle, those clear definitions and distinctions, that strength of argument, and those keen discussions by which light is distinguished from darkness, and true from false, exposed and stripped naked, as it were the falsehoods of heretics wrapped around by a cloud of subterfuges and fallacies. Those noble and admirable endowments, we say, are only to be found in a right use of that philosophy which the scholastic teachers have been accustomed carefully and prudently to make even in theological disputations. Moreover, since it is proper and special, since it is the proper and special office of scholastic theologians to bind together by the fastest chain human and divine science, surely the theology in which they excelled would not have gained such an honor and condemnation among men if they had made use of a lame an imperfect or vain philosophy. So he's applying this to scholastic theology in general, all right? So we're given Thomas a place of preeminence, clearly, right? We read the letter before, so don't, I can't be accused of like having not given Thomas his due or he's given it in the turn of Padres. It's clear, but it's clear as he's saying here that scholastic theology in general, scholastic theologians, is a theology in which they excelled. <clears throat> uh, now, this is from Studiorum um, Duchamp, which I believe is Pope Benedict XIV. I had it written down before. It's, it's immediately after, um, I think this is 1923 is what this was. So it's immediately after Pope Pius X. And this is what he says. And this is in Denziger, by the way. Naturally, among lovers of St. Thomas, such as all the sons of the church who are concerned with the highest studies should be, we desire that there exist that honorable rivalry with just freedom from which studies make progress, but no detraction which is not favorable to truth and which serves only to break the bonds of charity. Therefore, whatever is prescribed in the Code of Canon Law be sacred to each one of them that the professors may carry on the study of rational philosophy and of theology 
and the instructions of their students in these disciplines according to the methods, doctrines, and principles of the angelic doctor, and may hold, hold them sacred, and that all so conduct themselves according to this norm as to be truly able to call himself, to call him that master. Now, say the word of this. But, but let not some exact from others any time, excuse me, let me start again. But let not some exact from others anything more than this which the church, the mistress and mother of all, demands of all. For in those matters about which there is wont to be varied opinions among teachers of higher distinction among our Catholic schools, no one is to be prevented from following the opinions which seems to him more probable. Okay. Thomas has a place of primacy here, obviously, but but not some exact from others, right? These people that are doing this, that are saying we have Thomas is the exclusive one. Well, let not them exact from others anything more than what this the church, what the church says, the mistress and mother of all demands of us. Okay. This is a very common thing. You see this quite often with people where they will demand more from the more from the people than the church demands. Okay. And that's a clear indication that that should be a red flag for you, right? The church is saying here, for those matters which there is want to be varied opinions among the teachers, higher distinction. You can hold to the opinion which seems to you more probable. Okay. Well, let's now look at Alma Parens. Uh, this is from Pope Paul VI. Um, this was an apostolic letter, and it's on the occasion of the, I believe it was the 700th anniversary of the um, birth of Blessed John Duns Scotus. So let's see what the Paul the Sixth has to say. In the encyclical Eternae Patris, our predecessor of happy memory, Pope Leo XIII, pleads for the revival of scholasticism under the leadership of Thomas Aquinas and opposition to modern errors. This is what we were saying, right? After stating that, quote, St. Thomas towers above all, this pontiff enumerates other scholastic doctors, among whom a prominent place was reserved for St. Bonaventure. But St. Pius X afterwards calls the seraphic doctor the second leader of scholasticism. It is universally recognized that John Duns Scotus surpassed the seraphic doctor. It is also noted that the Second Vatican Council, Ecumenical Council, and its decree on the training of priests prescribed, quote, philosophical subjects are to be taught in such a way that the students are led to acquire a solid, coherent knowledge of man, the world, and God, based on the patrimony, perennial valid philosophy. This perennial valid philosophy certainly includes the Franciscan school. Here's another from the same. St. Francis of Assisi's most beautiful ideal of perfection and the order of the seraphic spirit are embedded in the work of Scotus and inflame it, for he ever holds the virtue of great value than learning. We are deeply convinced that the precious theological treasure of John Duns Scotus can provide formidable weapons in the struggle to disperse the black cloud of atheism which hangs darkly over our age. That's strong language. Okay, I know this is an apostolic letter, uh, doesn't quite have the um, significance of an encyclical, but still, this is, this is strong. Now what I think is the important one, um, where, where, attorney, where Attorney Patres was important, um, I feel like this one is the um, updating of what we need today okay attorney patrick was answering the need for the times this fides ratio phenomenal encyclical i recommend you go take the time to read it um fides at ratio pope john paul pope saint john paul ii and this is what he has to say the fruitfulness of this relationship between theology and philosophy is confirmed by the experience of great christian theologians who distinguish themselves as great philosophers, bequeathing to us writings of such high speculative values as to warrant comparison with the masters of ancient philosophy. 
This is true of both the fathers of the church, among whom at least St. Gregory of Nazianzus and St. Augustine should be mentioned, and the medieval doctors with the great triad of St. Anselm and St. Bonaventure and St. Thomas Aquinas. I love how we include Anselm in there. That's very, very pertinent. Uh, we see the same fruitful relationship between philosophy and the Word of God and the courageous research pursued by such recent thinkers who I, whom I gladly mention in a Western context, figures such as Newman, Antonio Rossomini, uh, Jack Maritime, uh, Gilson, Edith Stein. I get a load of this. In the Eastern context, eminent scholars such as Vladimir Solovyov, Lorovsky, Vladimir Lovsky, so uh, that's that's an interesting endorsement coming from a papal encyclical, um, Solovia, Florovsky, and Lovsky in particular. Um, I find that very, very interesting. But uh, point being, we have, again, um, Bonaventure and Thomas, right? Right in this. Okay. Um, further on in this, um, in concluding this encyclical letter, my thought turns in particular to theologians, encouraging them to pay special attention to the philosophical implications of the word of God and to be sure to reflect in their work all the speculative and practical breadth of science of theology. I wish to thank them for their service to the church. The intimate bond between theological and philosophical wisdom is one of the Christian tradition's most distinctive treasures. This is why I urge them to recover and express the full to the full metaphysical dimension of truth in order to enter into a demanding critical dialogue excuse me, with both contemporary and philosophical thought and with the philosophical tradition in all aspects, whether consonant with the word of God or not. Let theologians always remember the words of the great master of thought and spirituality, St. Bonaventure, who, introducing in his, um, this is the mind's journey to God, invites the reader to recognize the inadequacy of, quote, Reading without repentance, knowledge without devotion, research without impulse of wonder, prudence without the ability to surrender to joy, action divorced from religion, learning surrendered from love, intelligence without humility, study unsustained by divine grace, that without the wisdom, thought without the wisdom inspired by God. I think, well, one, I think this is just a beautiful, beautiful paragraph. And one of the things, and I think this so beautifully summarizes um, St. Bonaventure's um, itinerarium. Because I feel like when I encounter, I see this all over YouTube, I see it in Catholic circles galore, especially the ones that want to sort of style themselves after the um, scholastic model. And I'm not going to pick on Thomas here especially not going to pick on St. Thomas himself because Thomas is not guilty of this. But what I see is I see people engaging in reading. I see them engaging in knowledge, research, prudence. I see them uh, engaging in all of these things, but they're doing it in the way that Bonaventure is warning us, right? Reading without repentance, knowledge without devotion, Research without the impulse of wonder, right? That key thing. My 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 son um, wrote a. He's 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 six years old, and he he likes to make his own books. Um, and he wrote a book. Um, he drew a book the other week. Gosh, I forget what it was called. It was something. It was a lesson on God. At the very first page, it was a little girl, and she's got the little bubble above her head. She's thinking. And, the words in the bubble were, I wonder. <laughs> so this book that he's writing on God, my, my, I, I didn't give my son this information. I don't know where this came from, but um, he's beginning that book with wonder, right? So he, even my six-year-old son gets it, right? So prudence without the ability to surrender to joy. Action, action divorced from religion. Learning sundered from love. Intelligence without humility. Gosh, that's 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 everywhere. Study unsustained by divine grace and thought without the wisdom inspired by God. Yeah, I mean this this is it right here, right? Fides et ratio, beautiful encyclical. And look who he ends with. 
right? Look, look, I think this is the very ending of the encyclical. Um, he makes mention here again of Attorney Patris. You know, I've, I'm, I'm going on quite long with all of this, um, but I, I really just wanted to reiterate the point. And I think the key line here is at the bottom. Um, yet the Thomistic and Neo-Thomistic revival was not the only sign of a resurgence of philosophical thought and the culture of Christian inspiration. Okay? That's the key line right there at the bottom. We are um, we are indebted to Thomas. We are indebted to Thomism and what much of what the Thomistic thinkers have given us. And I'm indebted to Thomas greatly, right? Like I came in through the church through my study of Thomas. But I've really fallen in love with the church in my study of Franciscan theology. <clears throat> All right, now this is St. Bonaventure and St. Thomas Aquinas. This is from um, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, and I think this is a nice way to kind of end all of this. This, this, the bulk of this here um, is this little uh, audience that we get from Benedict, and this is what he says. I would like to study with you some of the other aspects of the doctrine of St. Bonaventure. He is an eminent theologian who deserved to be set beside another great thinker, a contemporary of his, St. Thomas Aquinas. Instead, uh, this is this is further around, it's further down. Instead, for Bonaventure, he's saying unlike Thomas, the ultimate destiny of the human being is to love God, to encounter him, and to be united in his and our love. For him, this is the most satisfactory definition of our happiness. Along these lines, we could say that the loftiest category for Thomas is the true, whereas for St. Bonaventure, it is the good. And it would be mistaken to see a contradiction in these two answers. For both of them, the true is also good, and the good is also the true. To see God is to love, and to love is to see. I mean, how how profound is that, right? Like we 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 see a lot of the times Thomas being, um, you know, the, the 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 saint of the intellect, you know, and pursuit of the truth. Right, the end of the intellect is the truth. Bonaventure, you know, so much as people know about Bonaventure, you know, his quote um, accused of being, you know, um, of uh, fideism, um, but Bonaventure seeking the good. Um, as if these two things are in opposition to, or even separate from one another, right? Uh, while they may be formally distinct, uh, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, uh, they, they are not truly distinct from God. But they are one and the same. Um, hence, it was a question of their different interpretation of a fundamentally shared vision. Amen. Right there. I mean, I could do a whole series on how close Thomas and Bonaventure as much as the people like to pit them against each other, even people that are favorable. Um, well, let me just, I'm going to try not to get polemical on all of this. Um, both emphasis have given shape to different traditions, true, and different spiritualities, true, and have thus shown the fruitfulness of the faith, one in the diversity of his expressions. I mean, this is a beautiful, this is a beautiful line right here. All of this teaching of Bonaventure is neither anti-intellectual nor anti-rational. This is against this accusation of um, fideism. It implies the process of reason, but it transcends it in the love of the crucified Christ. With this transformation of the mysticism of pseudo-Dionysus, St. Bonaventure is placed at the source of a great mystical current, which has greatly raised and purified the human mind. It is a lofty peak in the history of the human spirit, this theology of the cross, born of the encounter of pseudo Dionysius's thought, pseudo Dionysius's theology, and Franciscan spirituality, must not make us forget that Saint Bonaventure also shares with Saint Francis his love for creation and his joy at the beauty of God's creation. Okay, so. Um, one last thing here, right? Um, we've given weight to Franciscan teaching so far with what I think are some pretty strong arguments with the backing of the magisterial church. Okay, so we've talked about the um, 
the men that come along to the university and the scholastic period who give rise and incorporate Franciscan thought into the church, um, the backing of the um, Franciscan way through the um, endowment of this the seraphicum, um, its, um, its, its cultivation and nurturing through these encyclicals and these apostolic letters. Um, now we're going to go to the one thing that is the uh, most weighty, if you will, of the incorporation of Franciscan thought in the church, and that is the Immaculate Conception. Okay. Now, uh, I would say this is usually the most famous dispute between the Dominicans and the Franciscans. There's a long history of this um, from the time of, well, arguable about Thomas himself, but at the very least, the um, successors, the followers of Thomas, Thomists, uh, in the coming centuries after Thomas, um, the Dominicans and the Franciscans warred over this um, particular um, the time it would have been a, a uh, opinion, common opinion of the theologians. Um, and I'm going to do some more talks separate from this on the Immaculate Conception. I mean, obviously, it deserves its own time and its own talks. And I'm going to give that sort of Franciscan back into it in various ways through this channel. But for now, uh, we're just looking at it through kind of the weight of the church's uh, magisterial teaching. So um, the feast itself actually goes back into the, um, gosh, I mean, there's, there's the feast was in the east. Um, it works its way up into um, and finds um, fruitful soil in England. Um, but uh, by 1476, Pope Sixtus IV adds it to the Roman calendar. Um, and if you know anything about the um, Lex Arandi, that's 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 important, right? When something gets added to the calendar, to the Roman calendar, the universal calendar, that's an important thing. Um, 15, excuse me, in 1854, uh, Pope Pius IX defines it as dogma in the um, Ineffalibus Deus. Um, we also have Lords, obviously, the um, where, where, where the Blessed Mother says that she is the Immaculate Conception. Now, you know, that's, uh, that's private revelation, but anyways, that's still, it's got some weight to it. Now, I would like to note that um, the Immaculate Conception, this is important because this, this whole presentation is about the place of Franciscan theology within the Catholic Church, within the Church at large. So I would like to say, you know, the Immaculate Conception is not born in isolation of Blessed Scotus's teachings on the absolute primacy of Christ. In fact, I would go so far as to say they're intrinsically tied. Um, Okay, well, I actually made a mistake here. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, but see, this isn't my area of expertise, but I wouldn't go so far as to say it's a sententia fidei proxima. I think that's a little high. Um, I would put it more, it's it's probably, you know what, it might even just be pious opinion. Um, regardless, the, the absolute primacy of Christ as close proximity to the Immaculate Conception. And the Immaculate Conception, as it's presented as dogma in um, this, this in papal encyclical, in Ephalibilis Deus, um, to me, links it very close. Now, I'm not saying that the absolute primacy of Christ is dogma. It's not. Um, but I think it's got a little bit of weight behind it, given the fact of how close it is to the Immaculate Conception, which is dogmatically defined, is what I'm saying. I'm somebody that's more um, knowledgeable about these types of things would actually say something about that. So if you have a comment about that, put it in the, in the comment section, please. So what does this encyclical say? Well, let's take a look at some things. These truths so generally accepted and put into practice by the faithful, indicate how zealously the Roman Church, mother and teacher of all churches, has continued to teach this doctrine of the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin. 
Now, inasmuch as whatever pertains to sacred worship, it is intimately connected with its object and cannot have either consistency or durability if this object is vague or uncertain. Our predecessors, the Roman pontiffs, therefore, while directing all their efforts toward an increase of the devotion to the conception, made it their aim not only to emphasize the object with the utmost zeal, but also to enunciate the exact doctrine. Definitely and clearly they taught that the feast was held in honor of the conception of the Virgin. Now listen to this. They denounced as false and absolutely foreign to the mind of the church the opinion of those who held and affirmed that it was not the conception of the Virgin, but her sanctification that was honored by the church. Now, okay, I'm not the polemicist here. I try to be as charitable as I can, but I think that's, you know, I'm editorializing here. I'm adding my own thoughts, but they denounced as absolutely foreign to them. I mean, who was he talking about here? Okay. Um, they never thought the greater leniency should be extended toward those who, attempting to disprove the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin, devised a distinction between the first and the second instance of conception, and inferred that the conception which the Church celebrates was not that of the first instance of conception, but the second. In fact, they held it was their duty not only to uphold and defend with all their power the feast of the conception of the Blessed Virgin, but also to assert that the true object of this veneration was her conception considered in the first instance. So, when the just a little, just a quick just a quick side note with this, when the um, feast made its way into like England, for example, and it was being um, argued later at the University of Paris, um, one of the arguments that was being made was that the feast was the feast of her conception, and when exactly did the moment of her, um, um, you know, immaculateness take place, right? Was it in the first instance of the sex? So he's saying right here, like we've always, the church has taught with a unified mind. Okay, obviously, I, you know, anyways, he's saying that the church has, has consistently taught that it was the first instance. Continuing on. All are aware with how much diligence this doctrine of the immaculate conception of the mother of God has been handed down, proposed, and defended by the most outstanding religious orders, <laughs> by the more celebrated theological academies, and by very eminent doctors in the sciences of theology. That should be it. Close the books right there. Okay. The thing about, one thing I do know is that nobody in the church contends, right? There's, there's a lot of discussion back and forth about epistemology and, you know, um, how do we weigh certain teachings? Well, you know, Give the Catholic Church its due. When well, the Catholic Church clearly speaks authoritatively, there's not a lot of argument. You don't hear really anybody arguing whether or not the Immaculate Conception is something that's taught now definitively. Okay, And look at what he's saying in this document, which has proposed it definitively. Let me repeat this. The Immaculate Conception of the Mother of God has been handed down, proposed and defended by the most outstanding religious orders. By the more celebrated theological academies, what have we been talking about? And by the very eminent doctors in the sciences of theology. All know likewise how eager the bishops have been to profess openly and publicly, even in ecclesiastical assemblies, that Mary, the most holy mother of God, by virtue of the foreseen merits of Christ, our Lord and Redeemer, was never subject to the original sin, but was completely preserved from the original taint, and hence she was redeemed in a manner more sublime. That's very scotistic, right? You know about how Scotus talks about the Immaculate Conception. It's very scotistic. Um, let's see. We were certainly filled with the greatest consolation when the replies of our venerable brethren came to us, for replying to us with a most enthusiastic joy, exultation, and zeal. They not only gained, they not only, excuse me, again, confirmed their own singular piety towards the Immaculate Conception of the Most Blessed Virgin and that of the secular and religious clergy and of the faithful, but with one voice they entreated us to define our supreme judgment and authority of the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin. So to me, this is saying, 
right? We're talking, um, he's saying of the secular and religious clergy and of the faithful, that's us, with one voice at the time when it came to defining this, they defined it with one voice, okay? So that's saying that the, 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 the Franciscan teachings have been absorbed in a very um, organic way into the body of the church, okay? All right. Now, I'm going to be covering this uh, more in depth in a later video, but keep in mind here, um, St. Bonaventure says that there are three levels of theology, okay? He breaks theology down into three levels. One, he says, is this, or excuse me, maybe maybe better way to say it, three modes of theology. There's the mode of what he calls the symbolic. This is um, this is the, the, the symbol of the church, right? It's it's it's, it's clear. Um, it's clear symbols. Okay, the creed, um, recitation of the creed, and belief in the creed. Um, participation in the sacraments and in the liturgies and in the prayers and the life of the church in this way, right? So in that sense, any participating Christian participates in the sacraments, participates in the liturgy, is a theologian. Then he says there is the academic mode. This is more proper theology. This is what we think of when we think of theology when we think of a theologian, right, we think of the one who studies books, right? These are the ones who are studying the symbolic theology, studying the creed and the sacraments and these things. And then there's the mystic, mystical theology. This is union with God. And ultimately, what it comes down to is all saints are theologians. The goal of theology is that, um, to quote Bonaventure, that we may become good. What is it to become good? Well, to become good is to become a saint. Okay. So whether one is doing this at an academic level, proper theology, whether you're just a, um, I don't want to say just, but whether you're at the level, whether you're using theology in the mode of, you know, participation in the, which we all should be, right? Participation in the sacrament and in the liturgy, or God willing, whether you're at the mystical level, right? Um, the goal for all of us in all of theology is to be a saint. And all saints are theologians, okay? So with that in mind, is the Franciscan, is Franciscan theology profitable? Well, I would say that the proof is in our saints. All of our saints in the church are theologians. and the Franciscan tradition, the proof is here, right? I did this to be a little um, hyperbolic, but this is just some, this is just an example. But the sheer number of Franciscan saints and blesseds is just it's 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 pretty impressive. Um, so this is a long video. I realized that. Um, but before I get underway in this channel, I wanted to make the case that there is a place for Franciscan theology. I know that there are those who um, love Thomas. I love Thomas. Um, but I, it's not correct to say that that is all that there is, because it's not all that there is. There's really not even, it's not even a matter of between um, Thomas and Franciscan school. I mean, there's there's other traditions within the school, I mean, within within the church. So, but I wanted to make the case here for before I go forward with making, uh, because some of the things which we're going to go through in this channel might be different for you. Uh, it might sound heterodox. God forbid I ever sound heretical, right? But I want to make sure that you're aware that this tradition of what I'll be teaching here, in the most humble, it's it's, I, it's the best that I can, right? Um, I want to be able to present things to you in such a way as it's accessible to people on YouTube. Um, but I just want to make sure that you're aware that this tradition has pedigree and it has the backing of the church. 
So not only can we study it, but more importantly, we can preach it and we can believe it and that it be profitable for our souls and the souls of others that we all may become good. So thank you. I uh, appreciate your time. If you stuck with me through all of this, if you enjoyed this video, uh, like and subscribe. Um, I'm going to have a series of videos coming out here soon. I think next we'll probably be looking at um, why did God create? Um, so I'm going to dump head first right into Franciscan theology after this. So um, thank you for your time.